In our last episode on New Netherland, we saw Peter Minuet, the savior of the colony, canned, fired for some unknown, undocumented reason we don't know even to this day. On his way back to the Netherlands, they stop off in England and he's arrested for helping the Dutch maintain New Netherland, a colony that the English claim is within their territory. Very bad treatment all around. And so he's going to be back into our story, but for now he's gone. And he's replaced for a little while by a important person who worked at Fort Orange. The guy's name is going to be Sebastian Kroll. Kroll is described as the chief agent at Fort Orange for the company, and he will take control of the entire colony very briefly until the new director arrives from the Netherlands. And surprise, surprise, the new director is going to be the nephew of Killian Van Rensselaer, the man in the last episode who carved out his own little fiefdom in upstate New York that existed until the... I don't know, 1830s, 1820s. So in a huge power move, he puts his nephew in charge of the entire colony. When has this ever worked out? When have you ever heard about somebody hiring their nephew and it's been successful? It's nepotism any way you look at it. I'm reminded of the Office episode. I think it's called Nepotism, where Michael hires his nephew. And by the end of it, he's spanking his nephew because he's doing such a terrible job. Well, this guy's going to need a spanking by the end of this episode. So poor Sebastian Kroll has to hand over the reins of power to this new guy. And Kroll stays with the company for a long time. He's he's always described as competent. He's kind of like a bean counter. He's not a political type. He's not a personality. He's not related to anybody important. But he's a good, hard worker, and he does his job. So he's going to be in the background of this story. He's gone now. And then we're going to see this new guy. His name is Walter Van Twiller. Now, I'm going to probably mess this up because his name is Walter W. O-U-T-E-R. It's very close to Walter, and that that was my dad's name. So I might say Walter, and you're just going to have to forgive me for that. So Walter Van Twiller, or Twiller, Van Twiller. Now, again, this guy's the nephew to old Van Wren. He's, (laughs) you know he's not good. You can't hire your nephew to ever do anything competently. It never happens. It's a huge business no-no. If the kid was any good, his parents would be hiring him to do something. Now, Van Twiller, or Van Twiller, he's still, he, he works for the company. He's already an employee. He's a clerk in Amsterdam doing some sort of desk job, I imagine. And this is when he gets the big promotion because his uncle is a huge investor in the company. And remember, the whole New Netherland colony was handed over from the Dutch West India Company just to their Amsterdam chamber. So Van Run's running the show right now. And when he shows up in 1633, he arrives in a huge ship full of mercenaries. Mercenaries who know him and respect him and know that he's the ruler, the leader. So imagine the other company men in Fort Orange or down in New Amsterdam, and they see this guy come in, this rich kid from Amsterdam, you know, rich uncle and all this, comes in with all these guys with guns and big muscles and whatnot, pushing his weight around. I'm guessing they sensed right away there was going to be a problem, especially when you have a guy so competent like Peter Minuet, or even from what we've seen, Kroll, who's at least keeping everything afloat, then all of a sudden you get this guy, Walter Van Twiller. And now I'm going to get into a conspiracy theory, because every now and then I go into conspiracy theories, little ideas that go off in my head, because as soon as this guy arrives, or as soon as Peter Minuet leaves, rather, stuff starts to go downhill for the colony of New Netherland from the outside, meaning the English for the most part. Now, the Dutch and the English, even though they're starting colonies in very close quarters to one another, there was a mutual respect, and they had a bond, and their countries were more or less at peace most of the time. They had the common Protestant cause at the time. They have languages that are fairly similar, and they had other values that were similar. Um, And people respected Peter Minuet running the colony, the English especially. Governor Bradford of the Plymouth Colony reminded Peter Minuet in a letter. He sent him a letter and he said, you know, we're all going to live in peace together. Everything's great. He actually mentions, oh, we used to live in the Netherlands. You remember that? Yeah, we we were treated great there. Everything's going to be great between us. We're common Protestants. Everything's fine. That was 1627. In 1632, the Dutch purchased all sorts of land up and down the Fresh River, which we call the Connecticut River, so you can see where this is going. The Dutch, they thought the Native Americans have a legal and justifiable claim to their own land, and we should purchase the land from them. Whereas the English did not acknowledge land purchases by Native Americans, because they didn't think that Native Americans used the land appropriately enough to, to justify claiming it. 
So, what happens in 1633, after the Dutch have bought all this land and they put up a trading post and a fort and all this other stuff? The English roll in, by the thousands over the next decade. And these Englishmen were from Plymouth. They were from Bradford's own colony. Huge betrayal. And the Dutch even said, hey, we already purchased this land. We already have claim to it. We got forts set up. And the English said, we don't acknowledge Native American land claims. You can't buy land from Native Americans. They have no concept of it. So the English rolled in and they just stayed there. Now, the thing that occurs to me, and this is the conspiracy theory, we're going to find out in the future that Peter Minuet might have been a bit bitter about his firing. Did he tell anyone on the way out that this would be a good time to test the boundaries of the colony of New Netherland? Maybe. Maybe he told the English colonials on the way out, hey, you know what? Uh, the new director won't be here for a year. I'm out of here. You know, there's a couple areas that we claim that you could just roll right into. It's possible. I have no evidence for it. It's just the timing of it seems suspect. Or would seem to indicate that the English colonials knew that there would be this turnover period. So somehow they got the news. So with this move, the English managed to cut off a third of the territory of New Netherland. So New Netherland would be nestled around the Hudson River, which they called the North River, the Fresh River, which we now call the Connecticut River, so you know where this story is going, and the South River, which is now called the Delaware River. The English, they just take it in one swoop, boom, the Connecticut River is out. It's now part of these new English colonies, many of which aren't really legal colonies yet. They have no English charters, such as the Saybrook Colony and the New Haven Colony which we will learn about next season. So what kind of director allows this to happen? What kind of man was Van Twiller? What do we know about him? First of all, we know he came from a well-to-do family. Like we said, he is the nephew of a super rich investor in the Dutch West India Company, Killian Van Rensselaer. So Van Twiller is already a rich kid. He's probably spoiled. We know the type. One distinguishing characteristic that shows up in every account almost is that he was an alcoholic. He was a terrible terrible alcoholic and that's saying a lot for the time if you consider how much people drank back then to be considered a problem drunk you, it has to be a tremendous amount of alcohol we know that he was such an alcoholic he could be bribed with alcohol and we know his judgment just went right out of the window when he was drunk he would often get drunk and have drinking contests on the island of manhattan in fort amsterdam meant to be the defensive center of the entire colony don't you know Van Twiller gets into a drinking contest, and then he and his buddies, or whoever was in the room, they start getting into a crazy drunken fight going back and forth inside the fort. It got so bad, Van Twiller, in whatever sort of messed up sense of reality he had, decided to shoot a cannon off inside of the fort at everybody in order to disperse everyone? I don't know. Or, or kill somebody? Whatever ended up happening, he sets fire to a building next door, and he almost burns down the entire fort. But the Bucket Brigade managed to put out the fire, both metaphorically and in reality. So we got a violent drunk who makes terrible decisions running this colony. This is the worst person to have in this position at this time. Because we're going to have the English encroaching from the south and from the east. And there's going to be surprises right around the corner that I haven't even told you about yet. You'll hear in an upcoming episode. But there are other powers that, are, that be that are going to come creeping in. And Van Twiller is not the guy to handle it. Here's a different example of his uh, complete incompetence. So there was an English ship that was looking to trade up the Hudson, which of course an English ship cannot do that. This is New Netherland. Dutch ships go up the Hudson River. You can't have an encroaching nation just freely trading up and down your river. That would sort of invalidate your claim to it, wouldn't it? If you can't defend your trading resources, it's like you abandoned them. This is exactly what happened in Connecticut. So now there's an English ship that's coming past Manhattan, intending to go up the Hudson River. Van Twiller and his men, they see the English ship, and they threaten it. They shoot off cannons, and they tell them, come over here, come over here, you can't go up the, the Hudson River. And the English ship just ignores them, just, just goes right past them. And you know what Van Twiller does? He does nothing. He hesitates, and the ship whew, goes out of sight. It's somewhere upstream. It's ending up in what is now upstate New York somewhere. So after a good long while, Van Twiller goes, wait a minute, I can't just let this ship go about its business inside of my territory. So eventually he does pursue the English ship. But don't you know who was on the ship? It was Jacob Eelkins. 
which you might not know if you hadn't listened to previous editions of this podcast. He was a trader during the Wild West period of New Netherlands, a Dutch trader, and he didn't make it into the Dutch West India fold. So when they got a monopoly and they controlled the area, he got cut out. But don't you know, he wrangled some English people and now he's going up to trade with the natives because he knows them very well. In fact, we know the Mohawk knew him by name. At a certain point, this English ship takes port along the shore of the Hudson probably to settle in for the night. I don't know the exact circumstances. But the Dutch catch up to this ship. And the, the mercenaries are there. The Dutch mercenaries, they're all ready to take take this whole situation down. Here we go. The Dutch versus the English. And don't you know, Eelkins comes out of the English ship with a huge thing of booze. Huge barrel of booze. And he just says, Whoever loves the Prince of Orange, the Stadtholder of the Netherlands at the time, come over and have a drink. And don't you know, Ilkins gets everybody drunk. They're all having a big party. The Dutch say to the English, hey, we're your friends. I mean, they are Protestants and they have a lot in common. Van Twiller probably being included in this group of drunk hooligans. And then at a certain point, the English ship just slips away. And it ends up all the way at Fort Orange. Ilkins and the English end up right where the furs are being traded. Way far away from Fort Amsterdam. Way up the Hudson River. And Ilkins sets up tents for trading right outside of Fort Orange in direct defiance of all the authority that the Netherlands would have had. It's recorded that eventually, troops from New Amsterdam, what is now New York City, confiscate all the pelts and escort Ilkins and the English out of New Netherland territory. But this whole episode just shows you, like, how far you could get on this guy. Van Twiller is so incompetent, you could go from the base of New Netherland, past their main headquarters, past Fort Amsterdam, you go all the way up, you can bribe people with booze, including probably the director of the colony at the time, and then end up at their main trading hub, all before facing any real consequences. And these types of weaknesses Van Twiller exhibits over and over again. We have very little written information about this time period, and yet everything about Van Twiller just, just oozes this kind of ridiculous behavior. So at a certain point, Van Twiller and the company men, they confiscate a boat that came from Plymouth that's full of furs. That's all the details that, that I have about it. And the way the captain manages to get out of New Netherland custody is that he gets Van Twiller very drunk. <laughs> and he gets him very drunk, and then he escapes with his ship. It happens again. That's all you have to do to win up on this guy is get him drunk. And this is recorded in the letters of William Bradford from the Plymouth Colony. So these furs were probably obtained within New Netherland territory, and he probably had all the rights in the world to confiscate these furs. And yet you get a little booze in them, and you can get anything you want out of this guy. Can we find one success this man has? Can we find one moment of a competent leader? Um, maybe. Maybe there, there's a, an example I can think of that might be at least a half victory. So at a certain point, settlers from Virginia, Englishmen, they want to come north, of course. There's empty land there as far as they're concerned. And they're going to want to try to settle along the Delaware River, which, of course, New Netherland claims. At a certain point, the English come up and they take over the main trading post on the Delaware from the Dutch. It's, I believe, a bloodless coup where the English show up with overwhelming force and the Dutch, you know, this is not their fatherland. Their families aren't there. There's no need to risk their lives. They're overwhelmed. And so they just give it up to the English. That's the failure because that actually happened. But Van Twiller, for once, decides to do something about it. And so he sends an overwhelming force down there larger than the English and he takes back the fort and he gets all the people intending to start a little colony there, all the English people, rounds them up, puts them on boats, and takes them right back to Virginia. As far as we can tell, he did it in the most diplomatic manner. Nobody injured, caused no skirmishes, caused no warring. All right? So that is probably the closest he comes to success. Although the land was invaded, he retook it claimed it for New Netherland again, and then was able to defuse the situation, bring everyone back home without causing any sort of colonial entanglements or any sort of violent interactions. So in that is a little glimmer that he might have been a somewhat useful person as far as the colony is concerned. Even a small war with the English just among the colonials along the North American coast, would have been a disaster for the Dutch West India Company. Remember, as far as New Netherland is concerned, they're mostly looking to extract the furs from the area, and then if it becomes too expensive to maintain, there's a huge faction of the company that's just willing to let it go, just abandon it altogether. And around the time of Van Twiller's directorship, 
the Dutch West India Company is actually getting really angry at the Dutch government because the Dutch government is looking to make some sort of peace agreement with Spain. And the Dutch West India Company makes most of their money off of looting Spanish and Portuguese ships or controlling colonies that used to be in Spanish territory and are still in dispute. So they all their military focus is to the south. It's to the Spanish and the Portuguese. It's where there are slaves and expensive cash crops and there's gold and silver to be gotten. Not furs. Furs are, are secondary or tertiary. So if Van Twiller actually started a war, it'd be unlikely the Dutch West India Company would send an, a sufficient force to protect the colony. It probably would have gone, gone under right there and then. But other than this, I have a hard time finding an example of him doing another great job of managing the colony. The people at the time really did notice that Van Twiller was a terrible leader. They, they tried to replace him almost immediately. Isaac de Racers, which I quote from a lot, and I don't exactly know how to say his last name. As soon as Van Twiller came into power, 1633, de Racers actually married the niece of one of the directors of the company. So he, he became a nephew. And then he lobbied to replace Van Twiller as soon as he could. And of course, that fell apart very quickly. That was 1633. By 1634, they're sending over different officials and whatnot in and out. There's one by the name of Libertus Van Dinklagen. I believe that's the best way to say it. And he spends two years in the colony. And he's writing letters back to the Amsterdam chamber, just complaining about Van Twiller. He's one of the sources of where we get these ridiculous stories. And after two years in the colony, Van Twiller gets word of this and he sends him back. He just sends him back because he doesn't like him and vice versa. While all this is happening, the English moving in on the Connecticut, the English trying to move in on the Delaware, people trying to get rid of Van Twiller, somehow, in the 1630s, the Mohawk Indians get access to firearms. In our next episode on the Iroquois Confederacy, we're going to cover the impact of firearms on the Haudenosaunee. But let's look at it from the Dutch perspective, or the English or the French. Who gave the Mohawk Indians these guns? To this day, we don't have an exact name. We don't know exactly who did it. We have hints, and we'll cover that in an upcoming episode. But we have three nations that could be suspect. We have the English, we have the French, and we have the Dutch. Well, let's start with the French. The French, by this time, are mortal enemies of the Iroquois Confederacy. And they have a lot of native allies who are also enemies of the Iroquois Confederacy. And the French are not giving guns even to their own native allies. So what reason would they have to ever give guns to the Iroquois? None. None whatsoever. They're, they're out of the question. Now we move over to the English. English. The English are in a similar position. The English are a mixed bag because we're talking about many different little colonies in New England. And we're talking about many different Algonquin tribes that are still inhabiting New England. Some of which are allies to the English. Some of which are enemies to the English. But there would be no reason to arm the Mohawk to go up against one of your faux native tribes when you could just arm a smaller, more aligned with you tribe in New England. Does that make sense? Because the Mohawk have the reputation of being allied with the Dutch. So why would you give them weapons when they could just turn around and use them on you? In fact, the Dutch often use the threat of the Haudenosaunee being their allies as a way to help stave off the English. Because the Mohawk have such a reputation, especially the Mohawk, that the Dutch were able to go like, hey, you know, we're, we're okay with each other. But if you start something, you know, I'm, I'm pretty tough on my own, but, you know, we don't have a lot of numbers. But we got this tribe up north, right by Fort Orange there, called the Mohawk. Have you heard of them? Why don't you ask your native allies about them? So there would be no reason for the English to give the Mohawk weapons. And that leaves the Dutch. Now, the Dutch would be in the best position to get these weapons to the Haudenosaunee and have the most the most um, motivation to do so because they are part of this. They are connected by a chain. There is a brotherhood starting to be built there. But here's a little snag in the armor. Trading guns to the natives is illegal. Under New Netherland law, it is not supposed to be going on. And we know in 1632, the Haudenosaunee don't have guns. But we know around 1638, all of a sudden, they have guns. So what changed in the colony? Well, as it so happens in 1638, around the same time the natives get guns for the first time, the colony is opened up to free traders for the first time in a very long time. And this leads to the first massive influx of immigrants, either from the Netherlands or from a nearby area, and they pledge allegiance to the Prince of Orange. 
The company offers them free travel, and they can even participate in the beaver trade. They can even take pelts and trade it out of the colony back to the old world. Now, how would the company make money off of this is that they would collect a small tax. So we see a huge influx of free traders who are not working for the company. They are just working on company land, so to speak. And many came just to start a family. I mean, in this podcast so far, when we talk about New Netherlands, we really haven't been looking at a family community, a family colony. It has been a colony of traders and mostly men, mostly young men. Now we're seeing family units. So a lot of those early Walloon families, they've kind of disappeared over the decades. They made their way back to the old world or whatnot. But now we're seeing an influx of Dutch families and other ethnicities. But now we're seeing the beginning of actual communities where there's kids and there's old people and there's young people and married couples and there's lots of women around. The company offers free plots of land. And after four years, they'll start taxing you a little bit if you cultivate it and you're successful with that. And there really no, there are no surviving like census records from this time. So we can't even tell you who all these people are. The best way of knowing who some of these people are is that you're a descendant of them and they're in your family tree and they lived in somewhere in New Jersey or upstate New York or downstate New York and that's how you know they existed. But other than that, we don't have like a comprehensive record of who everybody was. And it was during this period, all of a sudden, the natives get guns. And whoever those people were, they had to be connected, if you think about it. It was illegal to trade guns to these natives. So somehow they were able to smuggle or bribe weapons past Fort Amsterdam, past Fort Orange, past all the different people who have eyes and are looking around and all the different people working for the company into the hands of the natives, and then also have a steady supply of gunpowder going towards them, going to them, rather. And the number one suspect in the historiography on this subject seems to be this guy named Ar Arendt Van Curler, or Van Curler, founder of Schenectady. We'll talk about him in an upcoming episode. No matter who it was, they can't possibly have imagined the profound impact they would have on history. Think about it. They're the first native group in that part of North America to have firearms. This is going to cause a reverberation to the middle of the continent easily. A thousand miles straight west. History will be altered completely. And we'll hear about that in an upcoming episode on the Haudenosaunee. But I'll just say this. You know, the old saying is, um, you brought a knife to a gunfight. It's the other way around. Once the Mohawk get guns and they give it, give them to their allies in the Haudenosaunee, in the Iroquois Confederacy, they're bringing a gun to a knife fight. And the result will be there are some enemies of the Haudenosaunee at this time who just don't exist anymore. Today, you couldn't find the tribe that those people would be the descendants of. It's going to be a huge deal. So did the Dutch trader... Sneaking away with some guns to trade to the Mohawk in the middle of the night. Did he know what was going to happen? Did he know the fallout? Probably not. He was probably just thinking about the fur he was going to get. But here's an example of a history-changing encounter for which we have no names for. We don't know who these people were. So despite Van Twiller being a complete failure and an alcoholic, and just, you know, he got the job out of pure nepotism, the colony is actually starting to grow for once. And the natives who are allied with the colony, the Haudenosaunee, are actually starting to prosper at least in comparison to the other natives, because, of course, all of the natives are suffering from old world diseases. But all the bad press trickling back to the Netherlands is finally catching up to Van Twiller. And in 1637, the Amsterdam Chamber is going to replace him. And somehow, over the couple of years that he was in charge of the colony, he went from being well-to-do, or at least in a well-to-do family, to amassing a personal fortune of his own. How he got super rich over that time is not exactly clear. But maybe we can assume there's been some confiscation of goods, where he's skimming off the top. Then in other situations we've seen he's been bribed with alcohol, maybe he was bribed with money. So despite being a pretty much a failure as a director, he comes out of the whole deal rich. He's a very wealthy man. And he remains in the colony on and off. He goes back to the Netherlands, he goes back to the colony, because remember, he's in the Van Ren family. So he's going to be helping the Van Rensselaers with their patroon ship. And I believe history, although noting him as a bit of a failure, probably treat him better than he should be because the next guy, the guy who takes over after Van Twiller is removed, is going to be so much worse. He really overshadows all the terribleness that Van Twiller ever did. And so that's what we got to look forward to. Also, Peter Minuet is coming back for revenge. 